Okay, this Hangout on Air is live. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, one of the biggest virtual jug sessions that we've had since we've started. Actually, the biggest. Uh, I'm extremely proud uh, to, to say that with us today we have a founder of Java and uh, current CTO of Liquid Robotics, James Gosling. James, how are you doing? No, I'm doing just fine. Excellent. And whereabouts are you uh, speaking from today? Um, right now I'm at home. At home, and that's San Francisco. Right? Right? City, California. Oh, wonderful. Um, okay, so James, today you're going to be talking about the the uh, the wave glider and also a little bit about uh, Java, right? Yeah. Well, and and why why Java is what is one of the big pieces that that makes it work. Awesome, awesome. Um, so thank you very much, James, for for being on the for being on the video today with us. Uh, with us is uh, Oleg. Oleg, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, really proud to be here and happy in this chance. Looking awesome. for a great session. And to, uh, what we're doing in 2015 is we're actually going to start um, a new interview series with every single speaker. And uh, what we're going to be doing is starting that today. So, Oleg, the first session you've got James Gosling as your as your interviewee. So, congratulations. I don't know where we go from here. <laughs> um, so. With us as well, Oliver. Hey, Oliver, how are you doing? Hey, guys. Glad to be here. It was a nice uh, winter break, I trust, for everybody, and uh, it's really cool to start the first session of the year, the first V-Jug of the year, with the man who says uh, he's probably the only, he's got the only engineering job that requires snorkeling skills, so I hope to be the only guy with a marketing job that requires uh, scuba skills, and that's that's where I'm heading for, so... Uh, thanks Today, for joining us again, uh, James, and let's get started then. Do yeah, we have any more announcements? You're covering Twitter today, right? Oh, yeah, I'll be doing the tweets for whether it's worth. Awesome. Yep, just so, uh, we verified that the video is on and people can actually access that, so I think we're good to go. Okay, awesome. So, coming up then, um, Java and the Wave Glider with James Gosling. No, really, we do have James Gosling. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Wave Glider project for about the first uh, 45, 50 minutes or so, um, and then we're going to be talking about uh, Java straight after that. Um, Oleg, can you see my screen? Yes, I do. Excellent. Um, so one of the big things that we're doing in 2015 now is the Virtual Jug is now uh, sponsored by Zero Turnaround, and we're going to be doing a bunch of media stuff on the Rebel Lab site, um, and that's going to include some of the uh, speaker interviews which we're going to be doing. Uh, a little bit about the virtual job. Uh, sorry, a little bit about our sponsor then, Zero Turnaround. It's a revolutionary developer tools company. Uh, you may have heard of it as uh, uh, from the tooling which we do, which is primarily JRebel, but also a cool new tool called uh, XRebel. So JRebel allows you to instantly reload your Java code changes, whereas XRebel is new, a new lightweight Java profiler that gives you profiler style information uh, as you develop. So really, really cool tooling. Um, if you wanted to hear more about that, you can go to zeroturnaround.com. And if you're watching this as a replay, there should be annotations on the screen now, so you can click on them and check out a demo. Um, the usuals for the virtual user group here today, there's an IRC channel on Freenode, which is at hash or pound virtual jug. Um, there you can have full discussions and also ask any questions directly to James, and I will put them to him through the uh, through this Google Hangout, um, please do share the group and session. Um, I'll ping a uh, I'll ping a tweet a tweet into the IRC chat, so you're welcome to to share that tweet. Um, and also, if you have any feedback as normal, please ping it to uh, at Virtual Jug on Twitter or directly to myself at S J Maple. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand uh, straight back to James. And James, over to you with uh, the WaveGlider and Java. Well, hi. I'm uh, real, real, real pleased to be here. Um, I've been having kind of an entertaining um, uh, vacation for the last little while, um, doing doing real work, or at least. All right, my screen just went weird. Is the channel still running? Yeah, channel still running. If you. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The, my, the, uh, the the screen is now just showing blanks for me, um, but yeah. So 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 these days I get to be a Java user, not a not a Java Java builder. 
and I'm I'm quite thrilled to be doing that. Um, so I got some slides that that show kind of what I'm what I'm working on, and um, let me just sort of go through some of those. There's a bunch of software stuff at the end um, that that shows how we you know built built the guts of it, but. You know, it's a it's a robot that 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 roves the ocean. Um, you know, if you see one out in the ocean, it's they're they're um, roughly at the at the surface of the ocean. They look kind of like a surfboard with solar cells on top, and there's usually a mast with a, that white golf ball like thing at the top. There is a is, that's a weather station, and it's about the size of a surfboard. Um, and it's not, you know, your typical robot, right? It doesn't have arms and legs or anything like that. Um, it's a two-part craft. It's got the the thing that floats on the surface. That's kind of like a surfboard, and then it's got this this funny winged contraption below it that's used for harvesting energy from the waves. And then there's this this cable in between. Um, and this this project started, um, you know, about a decade ago. Uh, really with a guy named Joe Rizzi, who was one of the early folks at Fairchild who um, lived in, in on the Big Island of Hawaii, and you could see all these whales, and he wanted to listen to the, the whales sing, and being an electrical engineer, he did all the usual electrical engineering things that were usually the equivalent of taking a microphone and a cable and rowing out and dropping them in, into the water and finding the a zillion reasons why a uh, you know a microphone on a cable in the water doesn't really work. Um, then he decided that he wanted a sort of a radio-controlled car for the ocean, and he brought in a, a couple of friends, Roger and Derek Hine, and then that worked really well. If you go to this website, JupiterFoundation.org, um, I think they've got the live streaming going now, um, but they are live streaming whale song from a couple of locations off, off the coast of Hawaii. Um, they do it sort of in the, the, the sort of peak whale season, which is just starting now. Um, and so if you want some really strange background music on your laptop, um, live stream the stuff from Jupiter Foundation. And that's, that's coming off of a couple of our wave gliders. Um, but then after they played with that, they decided that they could turn it into like a real product that other people would like because it's really just a platform for sensors in the ocean. And and it was clear that a big piece of, of what they needed was a bunch of software because pretty much everything that looks like a robot these days is is sort of a bunch of sheet metal around a around a piece of software. Um, and so I got hired to, 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 to do this uh, new generation of machine. And, you know, when they asked me, I said, it's like robots in, in the ocean. <laughs> you know, it's kind of an IQ test, right? It's just, it's just, just too wickedly cool to say no. Um, so I don't know how many of you can uh, see how well this video comes through on the, the screencast. Um, I think Simon was going to post the URL to it, um, but this shows you kind of what's going on. The, the, the wave glider bobs up and down in the waves, and it pulls this ring whack, ring, wing rack up and down, and it's got these wings that sort of flap, and they're spring-loaded, and they end up acting just like the tail of a whale. So it's this thrust mechanism that is completely non-electronic. It's totally mechanical. And, and it just, you know, as the waves go bounce, bounce, the, the thing goes forward. Um, you know, totally without any electronics or fancy actuators, it's generating, you know, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand pounds of thrust. And we can use that to, to pull sensors um, or we can mount the sensors on the on the sub itself, or we or we mount them, you know, up on the surface of, with the float. And of course, the float has um, solar cells and um, satellite antennas and stuff like that. So it's um, it's it's really a two part vehicle, which makes it kind of funky to sell. And then. Off on the back here, we, 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 we often tow various sensors that want some very still water. 
Um, so that's like acoustic sensors and such. Um, so like I said, it's a sensor platform. This is actually a diagram of an, of an older one. That we, we almost always have a weather station up at the top. We'll have uh, cameras, uh, wave sensors. Um, this, this one sticking down here, there, there's a, a really common sensor that people like called an, called an ADCP or an Adaptive Doppler Current Profiler. It, it sort of tells you what the ocean currents are doing down a couple of couple hundred feet. Uh, and, and really the only thing that we can control, the only sort of electromechanically actuated thing on the whole vehicle is the rudder. And the rudder is the way we steer. We don't have to control the, the, the thrust mechanism because it's just a bunch of hinges and springs and wings. Um, and the, the simplicity of the mechanism is what makes it so reliable. And for us, reliability is, is a really, really big deal because uh, we can survive really, really severe storms. So our, our design goal is, is, a, is a Category 4 hurricane. We've been through a lot of them. Um, we've been through a couple of Category 5s. Um, and building something that's, that's strong enough to not just survive a Category 4 hurricane, but to be in that hurricane collecting data and doing useful things is, is pretty entertaining. Um, you know, so the software actually has to do a lot to um, keep everything stable and running. And um, you know, one of the really important attributes of Java is that it, it's extremely reliable. It's very easy to build systems that just don't crash or, or that, that, that recover easily when, when things go wrong. Um, you know, when you're in the middle of a storm, it's not like things don't go wrong, but you have to be able to recover from them. So, one of the things that makes the whole thing complicated is communication. Um, when we're at any distance from the shore, our, our only real method of communication is the Iridium satellite network. If we're close to the shore, we'll use uh, GSM or LTE. Um, but that's only for the first like 10 miles of or so offshore. Sometimes we get 18 um, and near relatively populated areas. But for the vast majority of the ocean, it's 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 Iridium or one of the other satellite networks. But normally we use Iridium SBD. And the big downside of all these satellite networks is that they're expensive, right? So they, they all tend to an, average out somewhere around a dollar a kilobyte. So think about what that does to your notion of network protocols, right? If you have to ship your data back and forth at a dollar a kilobyte, right? That means, you know, your, 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 your megabyte image that you've taken with your, with your cell phone will cost you a thousand dollars to ship. Um, we don't have a big data problem. You know, so you go down to your local electronics store and you buy yourself a, an, an El Cheapo um, four terabyte disk drive. Um, you know, so we, it would cost us four billion dollars to fill our first disk drive. So at the time we fill our first disk drive, we can afford to launch our own satellite network, which is just crazy. Um, but it, it changes the way you think about how you um, encode network packets and about um, when you choose to send data and what you choose to send. So we have really different durability issues. Um, we have to worry about high seas. Um, we have to collect data inside um, Cat, Cat 5 hurricanes. One of the nice things about the Iridium SBD uh, satellite link is that it's is it has an omnidirectional antenna and it's able to sort of squirt packets out when when we're on the top of a wave and keep the messages queued up. Uh, James, um, James, yeah, quick, quick question about the how how it deals with these kind of uh, high seas and, and differences. Um, in terms of you've got the surfboard on top and then the sub underneath. Um, what which which is which is doing the propelling and uh, is this is the surfboard um, there for the buoyancy of the of the sub as well, keeping it at the right level? So there there so the, the, the forward thrust is coming from the wings on the sub. 
but the wings on but but those wings generate their forward thrust based on being moved vertically in the water column and the vertical mo motion comes from the fact that the float is on the surface so at the, at the surface of the ocean you know it's going up and down because of the waves but if you've ever sort of dove, dove into the ocean and you get down not too many feet this, the ocean is quite calm, right? The, the waves are really just a surface phenomenon. So we generate our thrust off of the differential between the surface motion and the, the, the much calmer motion at, the, at, at, at depth. And so the, the wings don't have to be very deep. I mean, the, our standard umbilical uh, to connect the two parts is is only four meters long, and that gives us lots and lots of thrust. Um, and and one of the nice things that that does is that the that the wings they kind of act like an anchor. So when you get these giant waves, the 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 top, which is just kind of like a surfboard filled with electronics. Um, it doesn't get madly thrown around because the wing rack acts like an anchor that, that keeps it on, on the surface. And in fact, if you've got really steep waves, the, 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 the float will actually get pulled underneath the, the curling crest of the wave. So it will do exactly what like a, 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 a human will do when swimming in high waves, namely it will sort of dive through the, the face of the, the large waves. Um, and that's all completely passively, right? There's no electronics in that. There's no, you know, fancy control system. It just, it just works pretty smoothly. Um, and salt water. Right. Imagine your data center surrounded in salt water, um, viciously corrosive. Um, the the connectors that we have to use are crazy. You know, uh, you know, a wet mateable SATA connector costs more than a disk drive. Um, and and you know, we we end up worrying about all kinds of materials problems that most people never get to worry about, and that's one of the things that makes my job interesting because I'm surrounded by people that are really pretty unusual. Um, you know, people who know you know in detail the 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 properties of you know the 500 different variations on stainless steel and. You know why carbon fiber is a bad idea in salt water because duh, you just made a battery because it's conductive. Um, you know, it's 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 perfectly possible to do engineering in salt water. It's just really different. Um, and and of course with sharks, um, we really do have to deal with sharks. Um, this is some pictures of a. Of one of our wave gliders after a shark attack. Mostly the the sharks um, don't do any damage. They just kind of scratch the paint. Um, and on and on this one, they happen to to nick a cable. This is the the only wave glider that ever lost control because of a shark shark attack. And we had one little cable that was exposed on this one, and it was unfortunately the cable that has the control signals to the rudder. Um, and it had a about a two-inch section that was exposed, and wouldn't you know it, it got nicked. But um, as you can see from the close-up detail here, pretty much all the the shark managed to do is to scratch it. Because like, see all of these markings here. This is this is shark teeth um, scraping the paint off, and um, you know from uh, from this, it's pretty clear that the guy's mouth was really large. Um, you know, not something you have to worry about in your average data center, um, but you know, it's 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 on our list. You're gonna need a big. But mostly because we have to. About it. What? You're gonna need a bigger surfboard. Um. Sorry, it's just a line from Jules I had to use. Yeah, yeah. Um, bigger is actually problematic because you want to have something that is small relative to the the wavelength of the of the waves in the ocean um, 
So we've done a certain amount of modeling of it, and um, it's it's difficult to get much larger than we are. Um, but you know, we get lots of gooseneck barnacles. Um, and they turn into into food for the fishies. So what do you do with them? Um, one pr really common application is as a as a weather buoy. So this is a standard NOAA weather buoy sitting out in the oceans and it's actually in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and this is one of our wave gliders um, we we collect essentially exactly the same data as this this buoy does uh, the the difference is that to install this buoy um, you have to load it on a ship and send the ship out and put a great big anchor down and the ships that, that do these um, runs out to the to the center of the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico they cost around hundred and fifty thousand dollars a day to run um, whereas our little guys you can sort of throw them in the ocean in you know Miami or Galveston and they just swim out to the middle of the ocean themselves and they just hang out collecting data for a month or two or three and then they'll, you know, swim back, and you can scra scrape the barnacles off. And of course, we we work a lot on different kinds of paint that that avoid the barnacle problem. But um, you know, being out for months at a time is really really easy. And you know, our 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 robots, you know, the the complete unit um, costs far less than. You know what it costs to send a, a a a repair boat out to the middle of the Atlantic to work on one of these these buoys just once. Yes, um, that, was, that was a question that just came in from uh, Mike Mitreski. Uh, how long does the journey last? Is it is it one day style or is it you send them out and they're there forever, just just bobbing around? Well, so 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 they travel at between one and two knots. If they're out in in like the deep Atlantic where you get um, um, you know, consistent good swells. Um, you know, they'll they'll be doing kind of averaging out at about a knot and a half, but they'll do that 24 hours a day. Um, so it'll take it'll take a a few weeks to get on station in the middle of the Atlantic, um, but they'll stay out there for months and months at a time. Um, we put a lot of energy into engineering for durability. Uh, which which really has some interesting effects on the on the software because you know in with most people's software if something goes wrong you just reboot it or you know there's 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 a person in the room that can go over and fiddle some wires um, here it's really out by itself it is literally in the middle of an ocean with no humans for often thousands of miles and if something goes wrong, the software has to cope. Um, you know, so some, you know, 90, 95% of the code is all about dealing what, what happens when things break. You know, so we have as many redundant systems as we can, as we can manage. Um, you know, we've got, we, we, we run with, with a minimum of three GPS receivers for some reason that completely escapes me. GPS receivers are just about the most flaky thing around. Um, but we have to manage all of that and be able to, to run it in you know various degraded modes. You know, so if, if we if we you know find ourselves too close to the the the, the north magnetic pole, um, all of our compasses fry. And so we have to be able to navigate without a compass. And that made last summer quite exciting, but we got that one solved. Because um, we spent um, a lot of time in the Arctic last summer. Uh, but the, the algorithms for navigating without a compass, are they, they kept me awake for, for a few days. Um, but, but yeah, they're pretty much out running themselves completely autonomously for months at a time. Um, sometimes we, we have pollution monitoring. Um, you can put chemical sensors on the on the wave gliders and they can you know wander around oil platforms and look for oil spills and, and the rest. Um, 
we end up doing uh, a lot of global warming studies for people, um, and um, you know everything from you know water temperatures in the Arctic to um, you know carbon oxygen exchanges um, to what's what's happening to the water salinity off offshore of Greenland. We did we've done a lot of those and continue to do a lot of those. Um, and we do a bunch of stuff with, with seafloor sensors. A, a lot of the world's interesting ocean sensors are on the seafloor. So, for example, a tsunami sensor. You don't sense tsunamis by putting something on the surface of the ocean that bobs up and down because there's so much. Well, a, 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 a tsunami is a relatively shallow wave. It's just very broad. Um, and and so in the in the noise of the regular waves, it's very hard to detect a tsunami just from the just from the surface of the ocean. But instead, what you do is you put a very sensitive gravitometer on the floor of the ocean, and uh, a tsunami is large enough that it distorts the, the the Earth's gravitational field by enough that you can detect that. And so if you've got a gravitometer on the ocean floor, how do you get the message out? Um, radio signals don't go through ocean. Uh, acoustic signals don't travel more than a few miles. Uh, what people normally do is that they string a really long wire. Um, but, you know, a, a thousand kilometer long wire stretched along the ocean floor it's not going to last for very long because stuff just happens on the floor of the ocean. Um, so the, the the majority of the world's uh, tsunami sensors are sitting there um, detecting tsunamis and sending their messages down a broken wire. Uh, whereas what, what we can do is we, we'll just park overhead and listen to their, their acoustic modem and we act as kind of a gateway between the seafloor and the, the satellite networks. Um, and, you know, we can do, you know, all kinds of stuff here and down. You know, we can, we can count, we can even count fish. Um, and, of course, public transport. Um, birds and seals and such really, you know, love to land. Fortunately, we're, we're close enough to the water surface that, um, you know, all the all the crap gets washed off pretty quickly by the by the next wave. Our um, our solar cells stay stay very clean because they've got this natural uh, uh, washing mechanism. Um, so enough context. What am what am I doing? So I'm doing this 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 new generation of robots that's all about um, you know, having more power and better hydrodynamics than the old one. The, these new ones, we started deploying them about about a year ago, um, and they're all about long duration autonomy and s somewhat more advanced autonomy. So um, these ones have the ability, for example, to, to, to evade ships on their own. So if, if there's a ship that's coming along uh, on a collision course, um, uh, sorry, phone ringing. Um, so if there's a if there's a ship on a collision course, the the robot knows about it and gets out of the way. Um, and they can also work in fleets and they can collaborate. Um, and they do um, you know all the navigation, power monitoring, and health monitoring, and situation awareness. And situation awareness is really about what's going on with coastlines. You know, it's got onboard maps. It's got um, Sort of the, the, the RF beacons of the ships around it, the, the acoustic environment, and, and all of that, that it sort of integrates as part of, part of navigation. And, and all, of this, all of this stuff made the, the software a lot, more, um, a lot more sophisticated than the previous generation, which was almost literally a, a radio control car. Um, and, so, and so I had the, the luxury of a blank slate. If you look inside, it's... it's it's pretty much, you know, from a software engineer's point of view, it looks a lot like a cell phone. Namely, there's a, an ARM core. The, the the current one is a is like a really primitive ARM core. Um, it's like it's like 800 uh, megahertz. Um, we're 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 
we have a we have a new one that's 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 got the the the, the Nvidia TK1. We're actually using the TK1 Jetson board, their developer board, um, which is a really nice board. If you want to build a a, a high performance data center, just go and buy a bunch of the Nvidia demo boards. Um, they're ridiculously nice. Um, most of the circuitry on, on this that you see, all these blue, blue things here, this is, that's the power supply. Um, we have, have you know, probably rather severely over-designed power supply, but um, it allows us to measure the, the power consumption of every piece of the, of the system, to be able to, to, de to detect and cut off shorts, um, you know, if we get salt water intrusions into a wire jacket, uh, we can detect it. We can detect sort of leakage currents in between them. Um, you know, all these kind of kind of exotic things that happen with wires that people normally don't worry about because they can just rip the wire out, or the wire is in air, not salt water. Um, and you and you know, if things short, they short, and you just put it in a new module. We actually have to live with things that are that are broken. You know, so so if something gets shorted because you know it got crushed or you know salt water got into something, um, we have to not die. So that makes you know the power supply noticeably more complicated. But you know we're running the, the Java SE embedded. Um, it's the it's the JDK seven version right now. Um, hoping to convert to the JDK 8 version um, as, as soon as is practical. Um, and if you look, if you peel the solar cells off, the, the hull kind of looks like a data center rack lying, laid down on its side. And, and all of these, uh, these, these sort of blue-gray boxes here, those are your kind of rack mount units with these cables in between them. It's a lot more practical to have um, individual watertight units than it is to try to, to keep the entire hull watertight. Um, gives us better isolation, and it's 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 mechanically very difficult to keep a hull watertight. Um, you know, because they 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 stretch, they they heat, they they get hit by things, um, and so we have these 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 these. Uh, these saltwater wet matable connectors, um, you know, it's, you know, at its heart, it's it's fairly standard data center stuff. It's just wrapped in stuff that's crazy. Um, and our our network archer, um, you know, so we've got these these edge nodes that are the the wave gliders. They talk through either a satellite or through a cell phone through you know, whatever the satellite ground station or cell phone towers to our data center, which we have like redundant copies of things. We've got, um, actually right now we've got like three data, data clusters because we have generations of things. Um, and then these feed web application de and, and desktop applications. All of the um, the, the data cluster nodes are, um, you know, quite fault, fault tolerant. I've lately become a real huge fan of Apache Zookeeper. Um, Zookeeper is just just wonderful. I I love Zookeeper. Um, and then so the the software that we run on the wave glider uh, is this thing called uh, Regulus. It's the main command and control software that, that, that runs in the box. It's, like I said, a big bag of Java code. Uh, the version of, of Linux that we run is a strange one that we get from, from TimeSys. Um, we picked that one mostly because it was the only one we could find that, that, that had, the, had the right device drivers for the, for the OMAP arm, arm board that we're using. We've seen uh, no JVM failures. The, the JVM has been remarkably solid. And one of the nice things in the Java world is the unbelievably giant collection of libraries. And many of the world's like surprising libraries are really useful in this, in this, in this world. So we use some of the mapping libraries. We 
We use some astronomy libraries. We use the the World Magnetic Model Library. Um, don't have much call for a graphics library, but we do use Jetty on board. We actually use Jetty to do like system management. Uh, you know, like like when an operator wants to do do maintenance. Um, we've got a uh, uh, a Wi-Fi uh, antenna on this thing, so if you happen to be standing next to it and you have a have a tablet, you can use the the onboard um, web server to access all the all the maintenance panels. Um, but like I said, about 10% of the the system, maybe only 5% of the system is is kind of the sexy, interesting stuff, and everything else is just staying alive. Um, you know, so like like all Java systems, as you know, mod modularity is everywhere. We're a, a generic platform. We've got a, a fairly well developed uh, plugin architecture that, in many ways, looks a lot like, um, say, servlets or or Java beans. Um, and these 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 services are kind of like servlets, but they have have some more some more depth to them. So. One of the most important things is this notion of life cycle ma management. Um, when you have a, you know, like in, in Java EE, you have a, have, a, have, a, have an EJB which gets dependency injected, and that's just is just dependency injection. But in in Regulus, we do dependency injection just like that, except that the dependencies can be annotated with. Um, what kind of state expectations you have on the thing that you are depending on. So services um, go through a, a variety of, of states, right? They, and, and our usual thing is that they go, they, they are getting initialized, then they're starting to run. And then while they're running, they kind of go back and forth between happy and unhappy. Um, and then they and then they'll, they'll often exit. A, a, a service that's exited is one that can be brought back to life. A service that's dead is just dead. Um, and you know, so that if you if you depend on something, um, then 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 your then the service that you know the service that that, that, that you depend on um, Will will block your starting until it is happy by default. But you can you can have all kinds of, of specifications of what your expectations of the, the the state of your dependent services are, and this turns into um, essentially a, a topological sort of the of the services that determines the the order in which they are started up, and the the um, the system really. Is really always booting, is one way to think of it. If you, if you, it, because system, things are coming up, going down, coming up, going down, da, 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 all the time, um, and uh, the, the 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 boot services never really stop, um, and uh, the the devices themselves run as services, and really the only difference between a device and a service is that the device is normally. Um, Attached to you know a serial line or an Ethernet port or something like that, and one of the the common sort of meta services around uh, devices is that we have this notion of, of of election. So if you have have a have a, a a device that's that's redundant like a GPS or or a compass um, or a or a communication channel, then um, We'll have a like a service like the the location service, and the 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 the, the location service will um, have all of the the GPS units or anything that can determine location registered with it, and the location service runs an election to to pick uh, what device it's using to um, use using as the source of of the of the location. Um, you don't want to just take you know whatever latest reading you got from any GPS because different GPSs have different errors and you need to keep you know the errors consistent if you sort of 
go back and forth between GPS units at high frequency, um, you'll get the impression like the like the, the 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 vehicle is bouncing back and forth 10 or 20 feet, you know, multiple times a second. Um, so you have to man, man, maintain a certain amount of hysteresis in the failover. You have to have notions of you know the quality of the devices. Sometimes devices that fail um, can be recovered by doing straightforward, simple things like power cycling them. Um, some devices have different failure modes, so some GPS units don't do well if they're covered with salt water a lot. If you've got high seas, some of them work better. You know, in in, in when it are when they are are high seas. Um, so it's 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 you know managing all of these things is uh, has been entertaining, but it works. It's it's been working really well. Um, inside, we've got this sort of publish subscribe interconnect. Um, that's all. That's all pointers. We have this this observable object mechanism that that lets you um, express an interest in a in a in a, in a value changing, and um, the, the the observable objects also get get persisted. And there's a way to have all of this connect up to heavyweight processes for a code that happens to be written in C or occasionally crazy stuff like Fortran and MATLAB. Um, but it's 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 a uh, you know it, it, it's it's really kind of odd how much it looks like a um, like like a web server only um, rather twisted. Um, so here's a, an example of a really simple service, right? So this is a this is a service called Equator Crossing. It extends service, and all it does is it adds a message to the log when you encounter when you cross the when you cross the equator. Um, so it has a listener for the LLT is lat long in time, and whenever it sees a, a, a change in lat long in time, it takes a look at the lat and the long and gives you the appropriate message. Um, when we initialize, it, it it doesn't have anything to do. We could have actually left this out out, and so when the when the service gets started. It it takes a look at this um, at its location dependency and adds a listener and that's it. Um, this is about the simplest service you can you can make, um, and and really the the two semi magical things are right up here where it says at dependency location service location, so dependency injection um, will fill in that pointer with a pointer to the uh, to the to the location service, and the existence of that dependency causes this service to uh, wait until there is actually a valid GPS. Um, so the this thing will not start until the, the the GPS system is 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 up and running, and it's run its election and it's decided that it knows where it is. Um, and then here, this is. It, it is subscribing to notifications from the location service for when the location changes. So this this observer gets gets called whenever you know the the system has decided that it's moved. Um, and it's all fairly straightforward. Of course, this would be so much cleaner in JDK eight. Um, just this, just this, 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 this listener and all of this boiler boilerplate. We'd lose like five or six lines of code here. It would be lovely. And and some of the things that I've got in here that are or boilerplate are are just here. Just you could actually just delete these lines. Um, so it's it's pretty straightforward to build a service. And these days we we've, we've been doing just about everything as as services. We've got a bunch of standard services, and of course, service management and device management are up there. There's communications and location. Um, there's there's an orientation service that tells us, you know, using inertial navigation units and, and compasses where we are. There's a situation service that tells us, you know, what's going on around us. There's a service that describes, you know, the mission we're trying to accomplish. There's the navigation service that. Um, it's 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 one that sort of ties together a number of services. It takes the the mission and the situation and the location, 
and 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 the the rudder device, and it steers the rudder. And then there's you know uh, a ridiculously complex system for managing the the power and the wiring diagram, and for monitoring overall system health and sending messages back. Um, and autonomous navigation is is a is a pretty fun part of this thing. Um, it, we have a um, the, the navigation algorithm we we use is is in the class of things that are usually called uh, uh, potential field uh, algorithms. Although we we actually uh, for sort of numerical stability reasons and because the the region in which we operate is the entire planet. Um, you know, a potential field that that's that's that large can get you into numerical stability issues. And um, I, I solved all my numerical in instability issues by um, essentially by 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 differentiating once, and it's it's a force. So it's a force field algorithm rather than a potential field algorithm. Um, and and so the a mission is is sort of a set of of sort of perturbations in the in the in the force field, and so this is a this is a mission where all of these these wave gliders. Uh, I'm not sure how well this is coming through um, in, on the on the, the on the on the Google Hangout, but this is this is four wave gliders that are all following the same mission, and there and the the mission is really simple. There's a there's a line with those green dots are at either hand. Um, they they want to be on that line, but as far from their 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 siblings as possible. And all of the calculation of their path is is entirely autonomous, right? So there's the that sort of starburst at the beginning that's 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 um, driven by their desire to be a, a, apart from each other. But once they're far enough apart, they all end up going straight towards the line. And then there's the, this this combination of wanting to be apart from each other and on the line causes them to um, sort of space out evenly, and and then when this this fifth one gets added later, it goes towards the line and the other ones just automatically reassign themselves. Um, and here's exactly the same simulation but with just slightly different starting conditions. Namely, we, 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 we drop the, the four wave gliders at the beginning um, closer to the line and closer to the end, and so they distribute along the line differently. And then when the fifth one comes in, it doesn't come in at the middle, it comes in kind of at the end, and they all sort of reassign where they go in different ways. Um, and these simulations were done um, a couple of years ago, but but now in real life, it, it actually works this way, um, which is which is really which has been really really pretty nice. Um, here's the same thing, only in this case we have another collider that comes through, uh, representing a ship, and you can see how the, the 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 one that's that's impacted by the ship gets out of the way. And interestingly, the, the, the neighbors of that, they also move out because they're trying to keep the spacing on the line to be uh, as nearly uniform as possible. And we've been through piles and piles of these collision events in real life. Um, this, is, this was one of the, the more entertaining ones. This one happened, um, I don't know, early last year. This is a screenshot from um, a somewhat strange command and control console that was that somebody was using. Um, so this is a, a, a patch of ocean just offshore of, of the Big Island. Um, normally, we have our, our our robots just just marching in square boxes to to do durability testing and whatever. Um, this this black line, that's the edge of of our test area. Um, we have a, we have an agreement with the U.S. Coast Guard that, that gives us essentially a license to a, a chunk of ocean that says you know we're allowed to test these things in this area, and it's it's it, there's a essentially uh, it's called a notice to mariners, 
and the notice to mariners basically says, you know, keep out, you know, autonomous robots with, you know, giant laser cannons mounted. Um, stay out. And most times people stay out. Um, but this ship right here, uh, this was the U.S. Navy. This was a, a Navy, uh, a group of Navy SEALs on exercises, and they kind of came through there, and they were, the SEALs were diving and screwing around, and they, they were paying absolutely no attention to any of the Coast Guard rules or anything. Um, but what's interesting here is the paths followed by these two wave gliders. So one of the nice things about the way that the, that the obstacle avoidance algorithm work, works, and it's, it's kind of an outgrowth of the sort of thing you can do with these uh, force field planners, is you can, you can sort of merge um, sort of different, different strategies. So this guy, he's coming down here. Um, this wave glider decided to flee. You see he's going off at a, at a 90 degree angle. And this one here, he just decided to kind of keep his distance. He, he's, he's just sort of in a standoff kind of mode. And this one here is fleeing. And the, these strategies actually blend, although you don't really see it in this example. If it's, if it's fleeing, it will, it will slowly um, blend into a, a sort of a standoff kind of algorithm. And sometimes it will actually just, just loiter. You know, if it looks like it's the, 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 the obstacle is going to pass in front of it, um, it will just, just, just sort of loiter and let the ship pass. Um, of course, loitering doesn't work with things that aren't moving, so uh, loitering never works as a technique for getting around an island, but it works as a technique for getting around a ship. Um, so it's algorithms like this are the kind of thing that make um, coding something like this in Java really, really, really important because you end up with data structures that get pretty, pretty complex. Um, and maintaining complex data structures in C and handling all the all the multi-threading issues and all the rest of it just 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 gets really really tough. Whereas in Java, doing AI kind of things is really really straightforward. So this kind of is like a, a piece of abstract art. Um, it's it's actually a diagnostic test. Um, what we did was, or what I did, I, I got, I got, you know, lo lots of people were saying, well, we've seen this obstacle avoidance thing work, um, but how do we, how do we trust it? So what I did was I took two wave gliders um, that, that, that had um, RF uh, transmitters on them, and, and I, and I got them to march around in the same patch of ocean, in the same rather small patch of ocean. Um, and here you can see this is the icon of one of them. And the, all the, the curliness of this is the wave gliders getting out of each other's way. You know, and you can kind of imagine a bunch of, a bunch of, you know, people, you know, milling about in a room going, oh, excuse me, and wandering around. So this is, this is, this is like, um, a zoomed-in piece of about three days of, of wave gliders not quite colliding with each other and getting out of each other's way. Um, and uh, the, the, this, was, this was a pretty convincing test. Um, so, you know, in short, you know, the autonomy part of things are, you know, the, the actual autonomy algorithms are pretty easy. The, the hard part is the sensors. Uh, the most reliable thing we have are these RF beacons that ships are required to to use. We've been doing some work with with acoustics, and they have issues. Uh, doing a little bit of dabbling with sonar. We'd love to use cameras, but the ocean is a really challenging place for cameras. We've got good cameras, but you know, imagine trying to to pick out a. a a ship that's likely only going to be, you know, one or two pixels on the horizon. Um, it's it's it gets tough. 
So here's a, a screenshot from last summer. We this is actually three wave gliders. Two of them are are um, really close together. We had we had this group that was uh, going up and down the Greenland coast. We had this group up here in the Beaufort Sea, um, and then this is actually even though they they look like they're close together, they are close together, but they were two different two two different customers. Um, and operating in some place like like the Arctic is pretty challenging because the North Magnetic Pole is kind of right here, and compasses just don't work. So that was entertaining, and working around ice was entertaining, and so it was an exciting summer. Um, fault management, you know, you know, most people don't think of exceptions and. Um, the, the sort of tight containment that you get around pointers in Java as very much because it's just sort of something that's normal but you know the the exception management system and the memory integrity system and the always on checking um, gives you something you can really lean on when you're trying to build reliable systems. Um, it's really easy to isolate failing components um, when things come in using class loaders and security managers, you can do all kinds of mag magical things to, to keep things contained. And if you've got software failures or hardware failures, you can you can handle them when things act unexpectedly. You know, there's not going to be strange corruption all over the place. Um, we live in a world where I think of reboots as being evil. You know, if you've if you've got an autonomous robot out there and it has to shut down for a few minutes to reboot, um, and that can happen randomly, if you are either like trying to collect some important data, or you're about to be hit by an onrushing ship, um, that's a bad thing. Um, so, like in the in the satellite world, they they often go into safe mode. They call it when 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 they um, when things go go crazy. They they just shut down and go into this like quiet state, and they wait for a human to intervene. Um, we never ever do that. Uh, we expect that the that the robot's out there on its own, and whatever goes wrong, it has to deal with it. There's no no human out there that's going to poke at it. And we can't wait for some human to, you know, wake up, get out of bed, go over, look at a screen, go, oh, well, you should do that. We just do that. Um, so we've got redundancy everywhere, all kinds of failover and retry and recovery. And, and, and a lot of analysis of the, the information that we get from the instruments because, you know, the instruments lie. I mean, you know, it's one thing to have things that break and you can tell that they're broken but often breakage is, is a subtle thing right? where where they don't just fail in a way that you can tell they're failing but they they lie right it's 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 what Byzantine fault tolerance is all about right when the, you know when you can't detect the failure but um, some of the systems start to lie um, Communications. Our communication system has has sort of three parameters around a message. Around a message, there's a priority that is really the the, the queue order, um, but there's also the the importance. So when we when you when we when we queue things, when we start running out of storage, um, importance tells you what you can throw away to conserve storage. So if we're you know far offshore and we're collecting a lot of science data. But we're, we've also got navigation data. Uh, the science data will be very important, and we will make sure we persist that to, to, to disk and, and do whatever we can to keep it. But um, all of the, 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 the navigation and, and sort of threat messages, they, they'll take priority. Um, but, but those sort of, those sorts of messages you can feel free to, to, to throw out if you're starting to run out of, run out of RAM. And then, and then we also have this this bid field, which is really saying how much are you willing to pay to transmit this data. So a lot of times, you know, particularly we're around things like like photographs. Um, you know, you're you're willing to send them if it's over 
over a, a cheap channel like a cell modem, but not if it's over an expensive channel like like an iridium satellite. And so devices are all characterized by latency, bandwidth, and a, and a cost. Um, security, we use you know symmetric crypto keys all over the place. Um, you know we allow customer supplied plugins, which has all the all the usual issues when you have allow outsider uh, outsider plugins. Um, you know security and reliability kind of the same thing a lot of the time. You know this whole write once run anywhere thing is such a lifesaver, right? So we run the code on actual vehicles. We run it on sort of the 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 brain unit of a vehicle, but not in a vehicle. We actually run it on a laptop. I mean, I do most of my testing actually on my laptop. We we can you can run an instance of, of Regulus in the cloud or inside a simulator. You can actually run Regulus inside Regulus. So one of the weird things that the planning unit can do is if it's wondering about you know what the consequences of turning left would be. It just starts up a simulation of itself, turns left, and runs the simulation. And you know, if it's wondering about whether it should turn left or turn right, it will. It can, um, you know, fire up two simulations: one if one turning left, the other turning right. Play the simulations forward, see which one works out the best, and then, and then, then pick one, pick which one. Um, you know, so this business of having a, a robot run a simulation of itself is a, is a really powerful trick. Um, timing and scheduling. Um, we're in a, in a world where we don't need really tight uh, real time. I mean, it's we're only going about a knot. I mean, it's it's kind of at the speed of a of a leisurely stroll. And the chaotic environment, I mean, the, the ocean waves are pretty much the, the definition of chaos. Um, you know, and that, that generates all kinds of events that would look like in a normal uh, real-time system, they'd look like timing misses, misses, so we've just got to cope with them. Um, we do have some real, real-time, but that's usually in like peripheral control processors, and it's a very, very tiny percentage of what we do. Um, this is me debugging the rudder. Um, for some reason or other, I've become you know the guy that does all the vehicle dynamics um, and a lot of the software. So I end up um, snorkeling and watching the watching the rudder move and all the rest of it. Um, I was out there all all all, all last week doing exactly this. Um, so it's it's it is definitely the only software job I've ever had that where snorkeling was the job requirement. Um, anyway, I don't, know if, I don't know if I have any little little demos. Um, we have some desktop apps. Um, so this is this is our um, this is our, our engineering fleet. So this is let me zoom back out. So this is this is uh, where we are in Hawaii, the Big Island. Our engineering site is is right here in Kwai Hai Harbor. This is nobody ever goes to Kwai Hai Harbor. It's an industrial harbor. It's uh, where all the shipping containers come into the Big Island. Um, all of these are are uh, wave gliders, and they're where they are right now. This uh, all this accurate all this data is is accurate to a uh, you know, this is very very accurate and very very timely. Um, Got another one that's uh, this one here. Um, this is also another. Um, this is this is just a, a few of the the vehicles that I that I test with, um, and so if you if you look real hard, you can see the the the, the this yellow dot here. That's that's the vehicle. And um, you can see it's it's actually moving, and it is actually out in the ocean right now in exactly that place. Um, so this is streaming you know, real time telemetry off of this this group of, of test vehicles. Um, and this is a this is a swing app. 
Um, so, and, and you can tell that there are, uh, there's just an astonishing number of lines here. And if you see how smoothly it zooms and it's actually rendering these lines, um, this is the kind of thing that's really, really hard to do as a, as a web app. If you've ever tried to do real-time, highly detailed stuff in a, in, a, in a web app or with Google Maps or something where you can control the, the UI, um, you know, so here's the here's a bunch of graphs of navigation data as this guy is going around his corner. Um, you can tell all kinds of things about what's going on inside it from these from these graphs. Um, but it's a it's a it's a pretty cool system. I have a lot of fun with it. So um, questions? What can I tell people? Awesome. Oh, I think there are a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome presentation. Um, thank you very, very much, James. So, so we've got uh, we've got a whole bunch that were uh, originally like uh, test and security based, which uh, which you've answered uh, in in some of your slides. One really interesting one from uh, let's see, is Joshua Wilson. Um, let me grab it. Uh, he says, uh, do you think that some of the, the logic and thinking would be also useful for space travel, uh, either manned or unmanned? What do I think about about what? Uh, about, about whether some of the some of the code and the design that you're using, is that is it also um, valid for a kind of space travel um, project, either manned or unmanned? I guess you know you you may see some of the, the similar problems uh, in the fact that it's unmanned and you know, it, you, you're, putting, you're putting this kind of code out onto uh, on internet yeah. environment which is very unstable and risky. Yeah, so, so um, one of the things that's odd about this project is um, you know, a bunch of years Sun was involved a lot with, with JPL and you know, myself in particular. Um, you know, and you know, all of the ground station software for all the Mars rovers is a big bag of Java code. And um, they had an engineering team that was working on a, on a, on a sort of a very advanced Mars rover that would have, have very sophisticated AI on board. And, and I, was, I was kind of a, somewhere in between a visiting scientist and the kibitzer on that project. Uh, as they, they were designing this, this really interesting onboard software for the rover. But, you know, given the way that, you know, American politics work and and our good friend George Bush who decided that, you know, we must go to Mars, let's stop spending our money on all of this stuff and we'll like put it in the bank for Mars and oh by the way we're raiding that bank account to send to Iraq. Um, you know, so that project just evaporated. Um, so the the next generation ro rover that's up there, the Curiosity, really is. is um, you, they, they didn't get to do as much with it as they wanted to do. Um, and 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 so if you if you kind of look at the wave glider sideways, it's it's heavily influenced by. Um, the way that that uh, JPL way, the ro rover was going. Uh, and in fact, I've given given talks at JPL and John Johns Hopkins about about this because the uh, you know if you look at the at the architectures of of our of our system and of the the rovers, they're very very simple, very very similar. Um, in fact, the, the slide deck that I, I just I just showed was literally the sl slide deck I gave at JPL, um, and you know a lot of the issues that they have are around how you build systems that are reliable. Uh, that whole comment about safe mode, um, you know, they go into safe mode all the time. Their their standard is to just shut down and reboot. Um, and you know there are times when they can't do that, right? So you know in the in you know when, when the last Mars rover landed, when Curiosity landed, they had that seven minutes of terror, 
um, from a software point of view, the, the terrifying parts of that is you cannot fail. Right? You're not allowed to, to reboot. And almost all of the other part of the mission, you know, when you're coasting from Earth to, the, to Mars or, you know, if you're driving around, you can afford to just stop. Um, and for us in the ocean, it's usually a bad idea to just stop. And a lot of the, the sort of fault containment stuff and yada yada that goes on in Java makes it much easier to keep on going and to isolate faults and recover from faults all while carrying on. Um, and you know, had some very, very interesting discussions with the folks at JPL about this. And, and of course, one of their problems in doing this kind of thing is they they don't have a good processor that they can run. So the, the the only rad hard processors you can get for doing these missions is is some flavor of a power PC. And uh, there and, it, and it's the very old power PC is the only one you can really get anymore. Um, and they've been working on getting uh, you know sort of through through DARP and the NSF some funding for somebody to do a, a, a rad hard ARM processor. Um, but, you know, the, the problems are almost identical. Mm. And in fact, in many ways worse. I mean, they have to worry about radiation. Um, but they're in a vacuum. You know, being in a vacuum, you know, there's no salt water. There's no sharks. Um, you know, radiation is, you know, relatively straightforward to deal with. You know, I would take radiation over sharks any day. <laughs> awesome. Um, a connected question uh, from uh, Max West in IRC. Um, in terms of the navigation software, I guess the project as a whole, um, have the Coast Guard or anyone else really uh, taken interest and, and, and wanted, to, wanted to get hold of the, 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 the project that you're creating? Well, we've we've had conversations with the, the the Coast Guard about doing things like patrolling the marine protected areas. The the the, the towed acoustic sensors are, are are good at detecting things like fishing trawlers. Yeah, you know, so you take places. Well, the U.S. has has huge um, marine protected areas, um, particularly. Um, Sort of going north and west of the Hawaiian Islands, there's this there's this chain of atolls that are a part of the U.S. that are this 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 gigantic marine protected area. That's where you know back in the Cold War, where all the the atom bomb testing was was going on. Um, but the, the Coast Guard it doesn't have anywhere near the the funding to protect any of these areas. And, and the Coast Guard of, of most countries don't, can't patrol their, their coast. So you get countries like, like Iceland and Chile that have huge coastlines and vanishingly small Coast Guards. Um, and one of the things that we would love to be able to do for them is, is um, you know, patrol for poachers. Um, yeah, and this is an interesting... almost in a position where we can do that. So there's an interesting follow-up question actually from uh, Sam Axis about the data. Does Liquid Robotics make any of the data uh, public? Um, sometimes. Um, a lot depends on the customer. Um, you know, oddly enough, the customers that are the m most squirrely are the oil companies. So, you know, if we're doing a study for a for an oil company, um, they don't want anybody to know. That we're even in the, that they're even in the neighborhood, um, and with a lot of like the NSF funded science grants, you know the, the 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 data is owned by the scientists, and and so it's kind of up to them whether they release it or not. Um, a while ago, we did this this ocean crossing where we took uh, four wave gliders and we went all the way across the the um, the, the Pacific. Um, I think the ones that went the farthest was was two that went from San Francisco to Brisbane, and um, you know all of that all of that data we we posted online, uh, and that was all uh, that was all freely freely available. 
and um, yeah, so we, you know, when we can, we do. We we don't have a really good sort of portal for for publishing those things yet, but um, we're sort of putting putting that together. But you know, in general, we don't actually own the data. We um, you know, we, we we do this work for customers. Okay. Uh, one probably last uh, uh, question um, on the on the wave glider subject, and it's actually from Jim Bethencourt, uh, the Houston job leader. Um, what initially drew you to the wave glider project? Because um, I presumably presumably you uh, started this straight after Google. Is that right? Yeah. Well, uh, even a friend of mine had had gone there, and um, you know I was at Google, and you know Google's a an odd place, you know, and they, they, uh, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do at Google, and so the most promising job was to, 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 to run some of their developer tools organization, which, you know, half of it is stuff that I thought was really, really great, and half of it was stuff I thought was just batshit crazy, um, and and then this friend came along that said, you know, robots in the ocean, and I, I mean. You know, as as a one-liner, who could say no to robots in the ocean? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, I guess you've got there are, there are slightly uh, more interesting challenges when you're talking about uh, shark attacks compared to compared to developing you know, Google tools or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Listen you, know a, 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 you know, a source code management system that'll handle a billion lines of code versus a control system that has to cope with with sharks. Yeah. <laughs> So let's. Uh, how about we take a switch to uh, to Java? Um, so we have uh, Jeff Sheets has asked a question um, about the recent Java eight editions of Lambdas. Um, how how early or was there talk of including any kind of functional programming in Java in the early days, uh, or was it ever considered to open Java to start Java uh, with with some kind of functional capacity? There are a lot. There was a lot of discussion of it. Um, I'm a big fan of functional programming. Um, functional programming has has some issues. Um, one is that for sort of average journeyman programmers, functional programming is really difficult. And functional programming works really well for some styles of operations, but for some that but but for things that Sort of intrinsically have interactions with the the real world where things are fundamentally not functions, um, you know, where where mul multiple things are happening at the same time and yada yada. The the functional frameworks get um, they, they 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 get they get difficult. Um, so if you look at, at code that I write, I tend to write code. I tend to write Java code in a fairly functional style. You know, so so I, I use recursion a lot. You know, I, I will use recursion rather than iteration if I'm like constructing an array and I don't know how long the array is is going to be. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do I'll do that functional style, and most people will look at that and go, "What the hell?" And I said, "Look, I did one allocation. I did not have to create an, uh, an array list and then copy." It. Um, you know, my equivalent of the array list is the stack. Um, you know, so you, you 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 know, functional programming as a style works pretty well. Um, you know, the it's been interesting looking at at Scala because Scala tries very hard to be a functional language, um, but they've got sort of procedural stuff that leaks through, and and it's I find it somewhat depressing. That if you sort of wander around on the internet and you find yourself a random piece of Scala code, um, the the chances are they they don't write it in a functional style. They 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 just use it as as um, sort of Java with operator overloading. Mm -hmm. And and talk so talking about the different JVM based languages that exist today. Um, a question from Harmeet Singh: uh, Which is the which is a good language which actually utilizes the proper power of the JVM? W which are good languages that what? 
that, that um, most utilize, I guess, the, the proper power of the JVM? Is there, is there a language which, uh, which you think suits the JVM more than Java? Or, or um, I mean, they're, they're fairly balanced that, in, in, that, in that way. I mean, Java certainly uses every nook and cranny of the JVM pretty hard. Um, but things like like closure, for instance, um, it, it 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 really uses the sort of threading and and memory allocation in some very interesting ways. I mean, the way that you can really run the entire universe totally lock free in closure, I love. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, my 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 major criticism of of closure is that. Um, Doing my PhD thesis, I think I used up my my, my lifetime quota of parentheses, um, and, and and so I was like, "Arr, Lisp again." I used to like Lisp, and then it's just like bang, 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 bang on the parentheses, and it's like, "Yeah, okay." So, uh, one other question about. Um, from I guess your your all your history with uh, with the Java language and the JVM, um, what's your what's your biggest regret? In fact, let's let's put this as a two prong question. What's your biggest regret um, about something you added into the JVM or or Java that you that you actually think well maybe I shouldn't have added that, um, and also something that you wish you had added. Um, boy. Yeah, you know, and, and some of them, some of the ones that are on my on, on those lists are really sort of hard to know. You know, so like like you know, among the things that I dislike are the like printf and and, and you know the, the 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 things that use C style formatting strings. Um, it's not that I have anything particularly against them. They 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 were put in because you know lots of C people were were saying we need something that looks like printf, and so you know the 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 folks just kind of like caved in and went okay we'll just do printf, rather than trying to do something more intelligent, you know and and that one just seemed really derivative, um, you know on the list of things that I really wish was there, um, I I think. Probably the top of my list would be operator overloading. Um, I've I've implemented operator overloading in Java like twice, um, and and the 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 time that I implemented it, the, that I liked it the most. I, I did a bunch of bunch of studies of sort of where the value in operator overloading was, and and really the the value wasn't so much in in operators like plus and minus, but but in in accessors. You know, so if you could say a sub i, which really turned into a dot get of something or other, or a sub i equals b to be, you know, a dot put of whatever. Um, the 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 usual problem with operator overloading is 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 the, this combination of how do you stop people from really being abusive about it because. I mean, the, the world is filled with people who are covered in scar tissue from, you know, the amount that they hate, like, many of the standard libraries in the C++ world. You know, so, 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 so using the shift operator for output or input um, just drives many people completely crazy. And then there, in in my my very first go around at operator overloading in Java, which was you know, fairly fairly straightforward operator overloading, I I literally had people coming into my office yelling and screaming and um, you know drawn machetes. It's like no, you know, and 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 a lot of these were people who had just come off of a big C plus plus project. That had gotten completely out of control with operator overloading, and one of the big problems with operator overloading is like with math, you've really only got four operators, you know, or five or six, you know, but it's a really really small number, and and you've got 
really an infinite number of functions that you would love to use with like cool operators. So people end up using plus not just to mean something that's like addition, but they use it for like list insertion or um, polygon unions or whatever. And um, various people have there, there, there was for a while a, a, an effort to to do operator overloading only using all of the math-like symbols in Unicode, and and so then you would get you know thousands of operators that you could overload, but then you would get something that is absolutely unparsable because the vast majority of the operators people just have no idea what you know three squiggles with a dot on the bottom and a hat on the top means. You know, it's like it's like crazy. Um, and yet, you know, when you look at, at Java code when people are doing serious math with like complex numbers or matrices, it just looks ugly. Um, and it's like, er, nobody's ever really figured out how to, how to um, Sort of straighten out those those two problems. Awesome. And uh, and one final question. I know we're running over time. I'm conscious. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, we'll do it for for those of you listening. We'll we'll also be running a very very short um, five minute or so interview after this session, which we'll make available on Rebel Labs. Um, but I don't want to keep you too long. But so I'll ask a, I'll ask a final question. Um, Everyone, everyone I've met, so when I said, "Oh yeah, we're doing a, a session with James Gosling," has always said, "Oh yeah, he's a, such a nice guy." And uh, I had a I had a call with you on Monday, and I left thinking, "Ah, oh, James, yeah, he's he's a really nice guy." So here's my question then: um, Running, creating an amazing, awesome project, product like Java, um, there must come a time when you know, in in the in the life cycle of the project, something slips; it's someone's fault. Have you ever had a Linus Torvald moment, or you know, when when everything hits the fan, have you ever blown up, turned into Mr. Bad Guy? Is there is there is there? Yeah, I I I I, I occasionally turn into Mr. Bad Guy, and um, it doesn't happen very often, and and when it does, I really hate it because I I I I get pretty explosive. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I just have to leave the room because I know that, that there, there will be blood. Um, and, um, you know, people who have worked with me for a long time, they, they can sort of detect when the, when the blood pressure is getting bad. And people kind of, like, run for cover. Um, well, that's, that's awesome to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I think my, my, my sort of... Net amount of 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 sort of grouchy behavior is pretty much the same as everybody else. I just have wider swings. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, James, um, the the feedback we've got on both on Twitter and IRC has been absolutely amazing. The the, the project is is hugely interesting and and entertaining at the same time. Given the different challenges that you you have, it's more like a a truly applied project whereby a lot of our Java developers here that we that we talk to very often is just pushing some code into production and, and watching some financial you know process happen that, that includes their code. So this is a real eye opener into into the real world, the real real world out there of, of, of software development. So so thank yeah. you so so much for uh, for coming on to the virtual jug and spending your time uh, to to tell us about you know what you what you've been doing in this uh, really exciting project. Yeah, well, it's 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 been a lot of fun, and you know this is the, you know as projects go, um, you know it's 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 you know it's the Internet of Things for a very strange thing, um, and, and it's just it's just been cool. Awesome. So uh, so before I go as well, I'll say thank you to Oleg and uh, Oliver who've been working hard in the background, keeping their Twitter, IRC, and Everything else, uh, everything else going. <clears throat> um, one last thing I will uh, show if I can just share my screen very quickly. Uh, one last thing that I will say is, um, so yeah, this was Java and the Wave Glider with James Gosling. I'll make the um, link available for the replay of this, so please do share this as well. 
Um, if you're following at Virtual Jug, you'll see the replay link uh, there, and I'll also post it onto the Meetup site and, and send it around to the, uh, to the full list as well. Uh, what we've got coming up next is a session with Lucas Edda on Duke, and this was by request of our members. So if you do have any sessions that you'd love to, love to hear about, um, do feel free to just ping me. Uh, and we'll get we'll get them on. So this is Duke. Get your get back in control of your SQL. Um, so this is a, a great library framework from uh, Lucas Edda uh, about how you can use uh, how you can use the Duke framework to to uh, uh, to abstract away your your SQL. So you don't actually have to to write physical SQL in your in your Java code. Let Duke do it for you. Um, so with that, I'll uh, just unshare my screen. I'll say thanks again to uh, there we go. Thanks again to James Gosling. Um, really, really appreciate you spending your time to uh, talk to the to the to the minions, the Java community. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, I'll finish actually just by saying uh, uh, one massive thank you from. Uh, let me see. It was in IRC. A big, big thank you for uh, for even creating and and, and delivering. Uh, Java and making what it, whatever Oracle says nine ten million Java developers very very happy uh, happy today. So so thanks very much. Oh, well, you're welcome. It's 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 fun and you know watching, you know you just just looking at like like the the developer statistics on Java, like now still you know you look at the the, the like the job rankings it's like it's like crazy. It's crazy how well Java is going, mm. and the folks at Oracle, I got to give them credit. They've, you know, for for you know whatever you might think of their them and their their reputation, they've they've actually been doing a surprisingly good job of of supporting Java, and um, you know it's something that takes quite a lot of cash to keep running. Um, and a and a and a quick. Ten second response to the ultimate question, which all the C plus plus C sharp developers love to ask: Is Java dead? Um, just go and look at the Red Monk survey. Yeah, I think that came out just very recently, which had uh, Java pretty much at the top. I think it was a tiny bit into second place with some uh, secondary language called JavaScript or something like that. But uh, never heard of that one. Pr pretty yeah. much top. Yeah, and, and what was pretty entertaining is is that there were a number of JVM based languages like like Scala and Clojure in the top twenty list. Mm. And if you if you add up all the JVM languages, um, the scoring looks more interesting. Mm. And interestingly, Swift jumping up to I think eleventh or twelfth in the list. But uh, yeah, pretty yeah, good. yeah. So I so I wonder how long it's going to. I mean, the, my my big issue with Swift is it only runs on Apple. So 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 who out there is going to write the first really solid Swift on the JVM? Mm. Yeah, good point. Good point. Okay, excellent. Well, James, I, we could carry on talking for another twenty-four hours, but uh, I'm going to make sure we don't so, so to, to 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 save you to save you dropping off. <laughs> so, um, yeah. James, thank you very much. Thanks for all the support for the for the virtual jug. Uh, James, if you stay on um, just for now, uh, we'll do that interview and we'll make uh, we'll make that available uh, very 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 quickly. So uh, thanks everyone for uh, for watching and see you on the next virtual jog. Cheers. Bye. Great show, guys. Right. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thanks.